Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our listeners wherever you are on the planet. This is World Smart, the podcast of the Aaron Fox Law Firm. We are your hosts and Aaron Fox International Practice Group co chairs. I'm Hunter Carter. And I'm Malcolm McNeil, and we'll be talking with partners, other lawyers, special guests about topics of interest in the law of international business and international business. Well, everyone, I'm pleased to be able to introduce a guest today who, as far as I'm concerned, needs no introduction, but you all need to have an introduction because you don't know him, but I happen to know him very well. His name is Tony Aguilera. Uh, he's the chief legal officer at a company based here in Southern California called ESI. ESI is a highly diversified company, and I'm going to have Tony explain a little bit about what the company does rather than me characterize it. But from a legal standpoint, they've kept me busy on all kinds of things regarding import and export regulations, labeling, real estate, OEM contracts, force majeure, lease terminations, option agreements, you name it. And those regions will go from Asia to South America to Central America to Mexico and also importing from Europe. So we thought that Tony would be an excellent guest to bring in for everyone to listen to. And first of all, I will say this morning, good morning, Tony. Good morning, Malcolm, and thank you. Okay, well, it's my pleasure. I think everyone will enjoy this very much. So I think what we'd like to do is to give a little bit more, uh, let's say, color to what I just said about ESI. Tell me, what are you doing at ESI and what is ESI doing? Well, just a quick five-minute capsule. ESI is pretty much the largest privately owned consumer electronics manufacturer, importer, distributor, and reseller in the USA. We started off about 30 some odd years ago, 35 years ago in consumer electronics. And now we've branched out into several disciplines, as you just described. Mainly, we're now vertically integrated and from manufacturing all the way to drop shipping, which we backed into it as a result of COVID. We started drop shipping and we also pivoted into other areas, other product mixes. But yeah, we we have about 150 employees worldwide. And as I said, we run the gauntlet from the holding companies where we are. I sit on the executive committee as an officer and a board member. And my role is to oversee legal compliance and HR. And I manage litigation and relationships with outside counsel. That's number one. Uh, number two is this operation we kind of, you know, to their credit, to the ownership's credit, they started basically as immigrants here back in 1980, and they were selling electric shavers out of a station wagon, and their warehouse was the garage in their home. So they now catapulted to basically having uh, real estate holdings of different types, from multifamily to hotels to commercial. And from consumer electronics, we hold major mature Japanese and Chinese brands as exclusive licensees and or distributors exclusive to accounts. And we also own intellectual property, both trademarks and patents that we license out and we monetize. That's kind of like the newest division we have. We took a page out of the Royal Phillips Electronic Monetization Handbook and kind of followed their lead. And we've also gotten involved in incubating small cap companies and then just spin them out. You know, cools out on that one still, but uh, it's a work in progress. And basically from all the core disciplines you describe are inclusive and fall within that umbrella. All I can say is, wow. And I'll ask a question and then I'll turn it over to Hunter because I can see him chomping at the bit, wanting to jump in and, and extend this a long time. I think the biggest question that everybody wants to know, I mean, I know because I've been there with you th holding hands through this last year's COVID uh, challenge. How did you navigate the challenges of COVID other than having reliable outside counsel there to help you? Just wow. Wow. You know, we, we basically sat back after the first EO was issued back in March of 2020, and uh, we said, okay. So we designated one of the paralegals here, the HR director and her assistant, and your humble servant. And we just started going after the WHO. It was a task force and not Daltrey's rock band, but rather the World Health Organization, the CDC, California National OSHA, the feds, the governor, and the mayoral EOs. State and county bulletins. Uh, we set up an ambulatory website for employees, a COVID website that was just a live document. Work, 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 uh, updating it all the time. We posted items all over. We were open door policy to all our employees and we, we researched and put together, uh, which I think you actually were there too, bro, a COVID prevention and distancing plan that uh, we actually 
put in our website, okay, our employee COVID website, we put in our handbook, and we post it. Okay, that was kind of the first initial steps. And then we started placing hand sanitizers, masks, and wipes throughout all our offices on every desk and in the common areas. And we basically shut the door down on visitors. The first two, three months, we shut down the visits. No visitors. That's it. And employees had to go through a non-obtrusive temp screening at all the entrances. And the visitors we did have, and I think that was a little later on, we required them to go and sign waivers. And if they didn't go by our screening temp non-obtrusive process, you couldn't come. So you get on the phone. Reconfigured our office space and warehouse and maintained a six-foot distancing. And we started rotating our office personnel from home and here so we could keep that six-foot distancing. And all the office personnel were given a laptop, whether they had one or not, or they had 10 of them, but they got a laptop totally keyed into our servers here at ESI. And we discovered the wonderful world of Zoom. So that's why everything is Zoom-like. <laughs> it's done through Zoom. To this day, I go through like three or four Zooms a day, and the world's changed. That's pretty much what we did during that era. I'm really okay. fascinated with what you've had to do to deal with COVID. Like every CLO I know, you were the one getting the phone call from your CEO or COO saying, what am I supposed to do? And you've got to answer questions without the information or the legal guidance. It is all new and all difficult. I almost want to start with you at the end of the story now because of the Zoom reference you just made. How has it changed you? What are you going to be doing Differently, now that COVID is getting under control, people are getting vaccinated, going back to work. Do you think you'll adopt some of the changes you were forced to adopt on a longer term basis? Inevitably, Hunter, inevitably. This is a new normal. It's been irreversible, frankly. The fact is that you can sacrifice maybe 10 percent efficiency and about 15, 20 percent availability. Okay. But the counterbalance is the productivity and the focus that you have on these Zoom calls. I think my old school, <laughs> where I come from, kara kara, you know, eyeball to eyeball in the boardroom. I think those days are in the rearview mirror, no longer with us. I think people have, even I, an old geezer like me, you know, I've actually now accepted the Zoom world or, you know, Microsoft Teams, whatever it is that I've accepted. It. And now it's part of my daily schedule. And I don't think there's a going back. Another thing that it strikes me you've probably had to deal with as a CLO during COVID is the global freight shortages. You know, you're importing electronics. You've got incredible relationships you just described. But you've got to get product from manufacturer across ocean to warehouse to consumer. You probably were already learning how to struggle with all the various tariffs and some changes there, but what's it been like for you to struggle with the global freight shortages and, and complications over the last year? Well, I will tell you that maybe we are a bit better off than others. Our supply chain pretty much starts in China, PRC, and there's some in Taiwan and some in Israel and some uh, in Europe and Mexico, of course. But since most of our stuff is Mexico, uh, that's more like the Samsung area and LG, and most of our consumer electronics and even our PPEs were coming from mainland China, their supply chain was not as affected as others. Okay, We've had long-term relationships with uh, Costco and Maersk. And yeah, we had bottlenecks at uh, the port at Long Beach. We didn't have it in Jersey and we didn't have it crossing the border, uh, the land border in TJ, but we did have a bottleneck in LA, San Pedro. We had that. And that wasn't because there was a supply chain issue back uh, in the PRC. You know, the issue was more here on the import side. But, you know, other than that, yeah, we saw that there was, I mean, now the, what is it, the flavor of the month is chips, you know, lack of chips or whatever. But back then it was the suppliers to the assemblers did not have supply. <laughs> but the Chinese had stocked up so much that you didn't feel it a lot. Okay? I mean, obviously you had to pivot to keep your sales levels. I mean, we are pretty much uh, knocking on the door to billion in, in revenues a year. Uh, but we pivoted heavily into PPE, and that seemed to be massively available. I mean, everywhere you turned, or looked at, or reached out, you got some sanitizer of some type or another, and that was readily coming in. 
whilst we were waiting for the laptops and TVs and the audiovisuals, that were slowed down a bit. But it wasn't a life-threatening issue for us. We hear so much about the bad news or about damage and harm. To hear a success story from you about the ability to adapt and take advantage of new opportunities is great. Malcolm, over to you. I was just going to say I didn't want Tony to understate the daily challenges that we were both facing as the executives were deciding what products to bring in and whether or not they were legal and met certain specifications. And also that we were receiving executive orders both at the national level and at the state and local level on products. So while they did pivot successfully, that road was fraught with thorns and bramble bushes, Tony, or you do recall that, I'm sure. Yes. The bottom line is I think we both talked about it afterwards and said that flexibility and resiliency were probably the hallmarks of the leadership of the company because they took risks, but they took calculated risks with appropriate advice. I think that what we've learned from it is that the good news, the company's leadership and its executive team, they were resilient and efficient and they were looking for opportunities and they weren't wallowing in the difficulties and that resiliency is what uh, helped the company thrive during a difficult period, wouldn't you say? Yes, agreed. And your relationship? I mean, how long have you been the CLO at ESI? Well, unfortunately for them, over 15 years, I've been here at the legal helm. I've always introduced myself as their charity case, which has guaranteed them a place in heaven. But, you know, we break it up. We have a very simple formula here. We have one of the guys, our CEO, Everybody's role here. There's a five, pretty much a five person uh, executive committee here. And it starts from the CEO is a consummate uh, sales. He knows the product and he knows how to sell it. The president of the company knows how to buy it. The COO of the company knows how to get the product from point A to point B. Okay. The CFO knows how to count the money and keep the banking relationship around. And all I do as a CLO is make sure they get to keep their money. I think that's part of the job. Keep the money and also keep them out of trouble, yes? Oh, yeah. But, you know, that's just part of what we do. Good, good, good. Uh, Hunter, I think in terms of the general business of the company, I guess you hit the nail on the head asking about the future and, and the Zoom world that has now taken the company, let's say, into 2021. And I want to add a little bit to that. Has the company now looked at other opportunities beyond what it's already doing that, let's say, have opened their minds through these latest challenges as to where they're going to go in 2022 and beyond? That's a very good question, actually. Very good. We are working under the assumption that current conditions, COVID, in all aspects, are going to probably linger through Q4 of this year and probably spill over to Q1. We're working under that assumption. Our product mix is not changing too much. We've developed a couple of brands. Well, it's public, so I guess I could, you know, discuss this. I mean, we brought back Gateway, which is selling like gangbusters. So we were very happy with that. We are now working on other licensing agreements, mostly in the laptop realm. Our audio video products are doing very well. We're just working on ensuring that our supply chain is there, even down to the chips. Okay. Some of the suppliers we have in Shenzhen and other areas of PRC are stocked up on chips, contrary to what you may be hearing. And one thing we've done differently is we no longer just sit back and talk to one company that says, here's the end product. It'll be FOB port, Asia port, and have a great life. Now we go to the company, which basically most of these companies that pass the initial title to you at the port are uh, assemblers. They're not really manufacturers. They have different suppliers and they basically take a tire or pieces put together and you have a computer. But that's all they do. So now we go down to their suppliers, make sure that they have guarantees. We've also entered the wonderful world of insurance that we now see. We've pivoted now to have the manufacturers provide U.S.-based non-contributory PL and GL liability with us as, as insurers. And that way we can pass it upstream pursuant to an in-dem to our customers the Walmarts and the Targets of this world. We do that with different products like Bird, the Bird scooters. We sell that, a lot of that. And we just do a basically a trailing indemnification and a certificate of insurance upstream. And most of our customers are okay with it. You know, basically you're making the customer a third-party beneficiary of your relationship with your uh, OEM and your suppliers, domestic and foreign. 
that's changed. We didn't do that before. That's a COVID development. Another thing in real estate, well, the IP stays the same. You know, IP is IP is IP, and it's kind of COVID proof, I guess. There's always trolls out there. There's always infringers. It's always, you know, uh, that world, that, that COVID hasn't really affected other than getting to a Markman hearing or something is instead of doing it in six months, you won't get an IPR for a year and a half. So even if you're in the rocket docket out there in Texarkana, you're not going to get there. So that has pushed back all these hearings and meetings and all that. In real estate, yeah, there is a very fertile ground now to pick up at good prices in the hospitality slash hotel sector. Uh, commercial is toxic. So right now we're more into multifamily. We're more into add-on value, reconfigure, and hotels. Because there are practically not a lot of people have been able to weather the storm. I would imagine small independent hotels rather than a chain or on both ends. Good question. If they start out first as small independent hotels mm-hmm. and then we flag them. We flag one hotel with the Marriott, the Marriott flag, and we're working on another one that we're under confidentiality, but it'll be another global chain. So we put global flags, maybe not first tier. But they're second tier. Remember, all these, uh, the Hyatts, the Marriott, the Hiltons, all, all these guys are coming up with different tiers, different flags. You know, the Bonvoy for this, the, that for that, the Hyatt with this. So it's not like Grant's Hyatt. It's this Hyatt, Rosewood. We fall within one of those. And the key is to just get onto their database and get onto the red system. That's really the bottom line. Well, Hunter, to you. Well, I'm just fascinated by how much you have to deal with as a as a chief legal officer in terms of the breadth of your company's business. And, you know, what advice do you have to other GCs that are out there trying to manage big portfolios within their companies? You seem to be confident and successful. I know from Malcolm how successful you've been. What do you say to your friends and colleagues at other companies who are chief legal officers about how to weather the many winds and storms and changes that you've been seeing? Well, I guess it starts off with exponentially KYC. Know your client. Know them intimately. Because the business folks, as I call it, the biz team, the biz team are the ones that make a determination whether or not to take the risk. Your job is to assess it and to lay it out in front of them. You say, this is what will happen, or I think will happen if we go this way. This is what I would do, you know, and you listen to where they come from. And then you really need to hang on and always interact with your colleagues in different disciplines. So you get a sense of security that, well, you know, my colleagues are doing this in labor. They're doing this in IP. They're doing this in compliance, in cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you have to keep the trade journals, for lack of a better word, voraciously read. I spend maybe two and a half hours a day reading our trade journals. I try to keep up with the areas I'm in. I mean, you won't find me reading trade journals for immigration law, but you will find, you will find me reading on other areas and making sure that you have an internal team that I'm not a good manager. For, let's say, I don't think lawyers in general, we are. I always compare it to, we are basically Viking raiders as opposed to uh, Spanish conquistadors. Okay, we come in there and we grab uh, Hunter Malcolm from their blueberry farm out there in, in Scandinavia, get on the long boat, and your client said, I want that flag over there in Normandy, and you bring it back. And then when you when you get the flag and you achieve your objective, you do the deal or it gets done, and everybody goes back to their little farms and goes back to what they were doing. That's kind of how we work. It's a team. And believe it or not, even though I, as CLO, I'm in the executive committee and, and, and I'm not part of ownership, but we're all treated the same. Everybody, we, I guess we raise our voices. We speak our opinions. It does help that all of us, with the exception of one, are ADD. So that's a, that's a plus. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it kind of like, uh, it's a lot of turmoil, but at the end, we speak with one voice. And that's why it just all starts about knowing your client and trusting your colleagues like Malcolm and trusting and reading and learning. It's, it's a never ending process to learn. If you think you know everything, you're lost. Now, let me ask you about the other side of the relationships that you have. You're talking about your clients, your internal clients, the biz team. What's your philosophy about the management of outside counsel? Boy, it's defer to outside counsel to gain knowledge in an area that you don't master. If you don't master it, go to somebody who does, who masters that discipline. 
obviously, as an internal, as a CLO, I've also got to look at the dollars and cents. You know, you, you, there are certain things that uh, we know that can be fluffed and certain things that are not necessary as opposed to things that are core. So I try to stick things to the core, keep things to the minimum, and keep our budget to the minimum. But I don't sacrifice dealing with the highest quality advice I can get. A la Malcolm, you know, I deal with several law firms, your firm uh, with Malcolm. Let's say I, I don't go pinching pennies when it comes to working with outside counsel. You try to go with the best and you try to categorize the level of importance that certain issues come up. OK, uh, if you have an unlawful detainer action, you're not going to go to Aaron Fox. OK, I, I mean, that's just silly. Now, if you have a major lawsuit, then you go there. <laughs> it's, 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 that's pretty much how it is. You try to categorize and keep it down to the basics and manage the time put in. Tony, I've been in those meetings, by the way, that you're talking about. As you know, you've had me participate in the mercurial meetings. And yeah, and I wanted to underscore that because I try to do that in my practice, but I've noted internally that, and you're also not just acting as a yes man with the management team. You actually critically quiz them about what their goals are in a given transaction and what they think they're going to get. And I think some CLOs might be more reluctant to take that approach. So I guess my question on that line would be, is it your personality or did you grow into the ability to be a critical uh, and Socratic questioner of the management team and their goals and their aims? Well, I guess I've never been accused of being a sycophant and that stuck with me throughout. I can't change the way I was born or brought up. It's just I never really paid a lot of attention to numbers, hence the lawyer. <laughs> so to me, every deal, or as Kipling would say, uh, face those two imposters just the same. And I do. So I've never made a big differentiation between uh, the ownership and uh, warehouse employee and things like that, other than, you know, when we have to deal with the core issues and events that uh, set up the strategy for the company. But I try to treat everybody the same. We are all here, or I've always been an equal opportunity yeller, so that doesn't change. I don't know. I guess every individual has their own way of being. I found certain commonalities with uh, our ownership group here. We're both immigrants, sons of immigrants and immigrants. We both came from uh, places that uh, had a nice thriving culture, and it was destroyed by authoritarianism. And we ended up in the greatest country on earth. So I got to thank Fidel Castro for that. And uh, I think the Asherians have to thank the Ayatollah for allowing them to come here to the States. You know, we would have never known it. So I guess it's just inherent that we have these commonalities and uh, we understand each other. And and uh, I think it's also I, I wanted to give a couple of comments to how you deal with outside counsel, because I'm one of them. There are others in other more, uh, let's say, esoteric areas that you've retained from time to time. And you've always come back to me and have said, you've heard this and does it sound right? And that's been something that's been the cornerstone of making us have a friendship beyond the legal relationship that we have. And I wanted to add to that. So he said he is Cuban by heritage and he's married to a Swiss wife and they they have their own international components, and I think that was part of what you and I developed an affinity with, was uh, interested in things international, and I think that's part of why the management team in your company, uh, let's say, trusts your judgment, wisdom, and input on these issues. Do you think so, or is it something else? Is it simply your sharpened legal skills? <laughs> I surely don't think it's the latter. No, <laughs> no it's more... Yeah, there is a, an international component to this because we are an international business. So we can maneuver. I can go to Israel and find that half the community in the real estate division. I can go to Israel and albeit I'm not a Jewish, I find commonality there with everybody wants to speak Spanish. I didn't know that uh, half the Israelis spoke Spanish and I can speak the, the different dialects uh, from Mexican, Argentine to my mother tongue, which is my mother, who's a Spaniard or was a Spaniard, Castilian, speak Castilian. I can muddle through in uh, several languages and understand. I won't starve if you drop me in the middle of Germany, okay? And, I, and I'll find a place to stay and move. My wife brings to the plate, oh boy, like five languages, including that, uh, that, that Dutch, which now I know how to pronounce that G-O-U-D-A cheese, okay? 
uh, uh, which I used to call it, Haura, and uh, she speaks uh, five languages. We've been, we travel the world pretty much, and we've gone, they've sent me out, and I take my wife as my assistant, and she just fits in, and we have developed relationships around the world. You know, my gal actually is a corporate baby, a Nestle corporate baby. Her dad was a uh, Vice Chairman of Nestle when he retired about 25 years ago, and she has pretty much a lot of breath in that area, you know, so it's kind of like where we are. But, yeah, I think it's a little of both. You know, what I know in structuring international transactions, which you have to cover everything from the tax base to the currency control base to the enforceability base to the dispute resolution base, and obviously before you go, there's nothing like boots on the ground, well, presume. (laughs) <laughs> There's nothing like boots on the ground, but you have to know the culture you're dealing with. If you can't go into a country and find out what their capital is, what their per capita income is, what their population is roughly as of the last census, how they gained their independence if they're not one of the older countries, and who their last two, three leaders were, and what are the major parties, and what are the major revenue streams for that country. If you can't go in there and have a chat with your colleagues and you engage them, you're at a disadvantage. So you need to study and read up a lot on that. Well, I, I think it's important, since you did bring in your language skills, I thought I would throw one of Hunter's credentials out there. You probably don't know this, but Hunter's international practice has centered for a large part in Latin America. And he also, I, I think he was given the designate of a scholar in the Spanish language. So why don't you ask him a question or two in Spanish and uh, see how his Castilian is? Vale. No me informó. Yo no sabía, salvo por tu apellido, que podemos sostener una conversación en, en español. Estoy completamente de acuerdo contigo que, que hay un, como una clase de personas en el negocio internacional que manejan estos asuntos y que tienen un gran interés en eso, y, pero también un, talen, un talento por hacerlo. Y en eso creo que hay mucha, mucha comunidad que podemos compartir manejando estos asuntos. Para mí es lo más divertido de todo en manejar un negocio internacional, a representar a un cliente que viene de, por ejemplo, Argentina o Panamá o México para un litigio en los Estados Unidos. No estoy forzado de aprender su cultura, pero al contrario, al conocer su, su cultura, al conocer cómo se habla, qué, cuál es el plato nacional, al pasar un tiempo en Santiago o en Buenos Aires o en Lima, eso sí, obviamente conlleva no solamente unas ventajas con los clientes, sino también una buena vida, una vida muy interesante. Pero interesante que, que, que no mencionaste, que, que hablaste el otro idioma. ¿Cuáles otros idiomas manejas? El portugués, es más portañol que portugués, portugués. Eh, el alemán, un poco alemán, ¿vale? eh, dos o tres dialectos del país de mi madre, entiendo catalán, eh, mamá ella era vallasoletana, el, la cuna de, de Castilla, ¿no? papá eh, viene de parte de, bueno, a él no le gusta que le digan alemán, le gusta que le digan uh, Bayern, Bavario, ¿no? Bavario, y Navarrés, ¿no? De Tudela específicamente, y por parte de tu madre, de, de Galicia y Asturias, ¿no? Esto es básicamente la composición mía, y te entiendo el gallego, te entiendo un poco, olvídate del vasco, eso es, tu, <risa> eso es apaga las velas. Entonces, eh, lo, lo que usted estaba diciendo hace poco, que eh, yendo y trabajando con sus colegas y clientes en los diferentes países de Latinoamérica, vamos a decir en Latinoamérica, ¿no? El centro, Caribe, el sur, porque Europa es otro tema, ¿no? Y España y eso es otro tema, el Medio Oriente es otro tema, Asia es otro tema, pero cuando vas a una ciudad como Buenos Aires, que es como mm. si París y Madrid se casaron y tuvieron un hijo, Buenos Aires, ¿no? <risa> Tienes el centro de cultura, la ciudad de México, que es tan grande que no sabes si estás en otro país, pero ¿cómo se expresan? ¿Cómo ellos, cómo se dice? Y disculpa, Hunter, porque estoy perdiendo todo mi castellano. Eh, mamá falleció hace dos años y ya no soy forzado a hablar nada, ¿no? Para eh, nada, para nada. Y vives... Eh, un ejemplo típico, cuando yo primero llegué a... Mi familia tuvo la franquicia de Burger King, o como dicen allá en Argentina, Burger King, ¿no? Eh, y fuimos a Buenos Aires. Y la primera noche llegamos, y yo con mis colegas, dos, nos sentamos, y ellos, por supuesto, cenan a las 10 de la noche, que no estaba acostumbrado a eso. Llegamos 
Y yo me di cuenta que yo y Willy, mi primo y mi tío, estábamos caminando más rápido que todo el mundo, estábamos ordenando ya, y clientes y, y los socios de nosotros y los abogados dicen, mano, muy sencillo, ustedes los americanos viven para trabajar, nosotros trabajamos para vivir. Así que, chill, ¿no? Slow down. ¿eh? Y entonces ya me fui acostumbrando poco a poco. Llega así y dice, bueno, vale, vamos a ir a almorzar, la copita de vino, ¿no? El anticucho, bye, bye, ya poco a poco. Entonces dice, bueno, ok. En vez de, no, nadie sale, eh, eh, bottle water aquí para todo el mundo y un sándwich. Y ya, punto. Vamos y sigue. Y sigue enseñando aquí. Ya es eso... Después de ya los primeros meses, usted sabe lo que estoy diciendo. Yo perfectamente, te entiendo perfectamente, pero es una de las, de las lecciones que aprendí hace mucho tiempo, pasando un tiempo en Colombia, donde mi esposo vive, vivió, eh, de donde viene, eh, donde hay la familia. Tenemos un apartamento allá y aprendí de los colombianos una importante lección de la vida, que es precisamente lo que dijiste tú, que no es trabajar para vivir, sino vivir para trabajar. De lo contrario, eh, uno puede gozar de las cosas buenas en la vida, de la mejor comida, de, de, del ritmo, de las distintas músicas, las músicas que, que, que se encuentran en distintas partes del país. Al aprender que un país como Colombia no es un país, sino muchos países, la montaña, oh. la costa, el río, etcétera, los llanos. Así que me, me ha dado una vida muy afortunada, la verdad, y por encima tengo un negocio. Ay, imagínate, sí. bueno, Colombia es un ejemplo, Colombia tiene uh, Bogotá, que es un país, eh, Cartagena es otro, Medellín es otro, vaya, tienes, eh, y entonces tienes eh, ahí Armenia, eh, 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 yo he trabajado mucho en Colombia porque uno de nuestros clientes eh, más grande es eh, Price Smart. ¿No? Y Price Smart eh, hizo hincapié hace unos cinco años allá en Colombia y, y nosotros eh, servimos el cliente, ¿no? Entonces establecimos una subsidiaria. Cada vez eh, uno sigue el cliente, ¿no? Ellos son uno de los mejores clientes que le vendemos productos. Yo solo termino diciendo que estamos completamente de acuerdo en eso y que obviamente al conocer un país es aprender algo mucho más allá de los titulares y a reconocer dónde hay oportunidades. Vale. Y estos países, en América Latina, has mencionado muchos, para mí son países de oportunidad. Y pese a lo que se ve en un, en un titular o que, de un problema que están sufriendo, ellos tienen una capacidad resiliente de sobrevivir, de, de sobrepasar sus dificultades y encontrar una buena vida también. Y por eso yo creo vemos las oportunidades de negocios también como forma de ayudarlos en, en su forma de avanzar en su país, pero también de compartir esas experiencias y oportunidades de negocios. Bueno, Malcolm, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you for letting me have a nice, friendly chat in my second tongue with uh, Tony. This has been a great conversation. I enjoyed watching, and for the benefit of those that do not speak Spanish, Hunter and Tony were discussing their favorite empanada recipes. <laughs> so uh, they will share those with you if you send them a short text or email, and they will send it off to you. Uh, so, you should, Malcolm, that the subject of empanadas is a very tricky one to manage in any language. Everyone has their favorites, and everyone is convinced that theirs is the best. Oh, yes. Yeah, that, 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 that is empanada wars. There's empanada wars. Yeah. <laughs> God, Ch Chile and Argentina almost went to war over an empanada. No, it is. It's I want to put a word in for the empanadas Envigareñas from the little town next to my town in Medellin uh, called Envigado, which are just delicious. And I just wish I could be there with them right now. But soon enough, we can travel. Well, I, I love Antonio Carlos Jobim, and uh, I, my first song that I remember is The Girl from Empanada. So that is <laughs> my, uh, we can close on that remark uh, uh, at this time. Tony, thank yes. you very much for taking the time out because I know how you are run ragged uh, from one side to the other in terms of the things that you do for the company. They're lucky to have you, and we are very much appreciative that you would take this time out to join us on World Smart. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, Malcolm, that was really quite a conversation, and I very much enjoyed the chance to have a little surprise dialogue with him in Spanish. You should have told him I, I speak 
we could have done more of the interview in Spanish, but then you wouldn't have known. But as I listened to him, I was so impressed that this guy has so many things to manage, so many different legal themes and subjects, and he manages them all. I can rattle them off terrifically. But for a company that has its fingers in lots of different uh, diverse fields of business, is really quite impressive. But what it all boiled down to was one thing that he said for me, which was his advice is to, to other general counsel is to know your client. And he, it's clear that he does. And I know you've seen him in action, uh, but he knows how to mix it up with them or whatever it is that it takes to, to, to do it right. And that's going to be what I take away from this interview. Uh, Hunter, quite right. Um, I, I have been in those meetings. I've been in lively discussions with management and, and in this context, Tony will tell me outside, well, let's say executive one uh, is looking at it this way, executive two that way. And he has a keen understanding of what each decision maker's personality is. So when he says know your client, he's really saying know your client's management team and understand the hierarchy and also know how to communicate because he communicates with each one of them differently. So yeah, get to know them. And I think his length of time there has also been very helpful. I think a new GC, for example, will have a tough time acclimating to the environment because of its rigor. But as you sort of settle in and the confidence works, which probably works in all relationships to some degree. But once that happens in this environment, uh, now he's firmly ensconced. Was there something else about the interview that really stood out for you? Well, it's hard to say because I've been in constant contact with them all through 2020. You know, I've I've been the helping hand. I've taken the laboring oar on certain things, but they expect a lot of him. So I think the takeaway that I would want to come out of it is that Tony is not just a GC from nine to five, but he's a GC 24 seven. They take advantage of him late nights, early mornings, international calls and those kinds of things. So he's a very proactive GC and his accessibility is, I think, part of why the, the relationship is so successful between him and the management team. Well, as we both know, working for international clients means taking their calls when they're working, and that could be any time of day. Thanks again for bringing Tony to us. I'm sure our listeners will enjoy listening to him. Thank you for your participation. Thank Kathy for her technical support. And until the next time, we are world smart. <laughs>